Hi, everyone. I want to take the second half of our semester to sort of do a bit of a reboot and a return to basics or a back to basics. Um, as I review the course material, it really gets really deep into the weeds. And I want to take a step back to talk about at a higher level uh, a few different concepts. And that will be the structure of the course as we move forward. The first thing that I really want to start working on will be descriptive analytics, uh, analytics that describe an event um, or what's going on within a company. And so for our first piece, we're going to do descriptive and then predictive analytics. So again, some things we'll take a look at here, uh, the nature of data around BI and analytics, the methodology, um, statistical modeling, and the relationships there. Um, descriptives and inferential statistics. And we'll talk a little bit about reporting and some uh, evolution of, of reporting in business. Uh, we'll talk about the importance of data and, and some visualization and why, why we need it so much in business or why it's used so much in business and so popular. Talk about some visualization techniques and um, then we'll go from there. And we'll talk about a little bit around uh, dashboarding as well. So let's get started with just the nature of data, some background on data, and what data really is. Um, data or data, however you want to pronounce it, is perfectly fine. Don't let anybody judge you for how you want to say it. So what is data or data? It's just a collection of facts um, that we're hopefully storing where in a database. And again, that database can be a SQL database, a MySQL database, an Oracle database, um, it could be a flat file database or, you know, really it can be Excel. Excel, again, is a database. Where do we get this from? Usually some experience and observation and experiments. Uh, you know, it's collected through those kinds of activities, transactions, lots of different things. That's where data comes from. Data comes from just about everywhere. It can be words, um, numbers. Those are usually more along the lines of what we call discrete data. Um, and it can also be images, for instance. Um, <clears throat> it is the lowest level of what we'll say abstraction. It is the least, the least common the, or the most broken down of all forms of, uh, of knowledge or data that we can get. Um, and it's uh, from which information and knowledge are derived. Um, the next piece here, data is the source for information and knowledge this is often a bit of a chicken and egg discussion what comes first data information or knowledge do we get the data first and then it's knowledge or information or does the knowledge come first consisting of data and we turn that in for, into information do we get the information which consists of data and we turn it into knowledge or does the information comes first we turn that into data and it becomes knowledge or in what form is that? The DIK or the ADIK model is something that is hotly contested and it is the chicken or the egg of the data world, which comes first. And data quality and data integrity are absolutely critical to the analysis. Hopefully in your lifetime, you've heard of garbage in, garbage out that absolutely applies to the data world. The analysis that we can pull from the data uh, is only as good as the data that's going into the database. So we want to do everything we can to make sure that we're getting as good or clean data as possible uh, in, into our database. And usually that's impossible. All the data that we're gonna collect is, is pretty rough, is pretty dirty. Um, and we have to spend a considerable amount of time cleaning that up but the cleaner we can get it, the better. So um, just kind of putting some of that into a graphical kind of form here. Um, in the upper left corner, we might have a enterprise resource, um, a customer resource management. We might have a supply chain that are all kind of those processes that are running our business. And we have nice pretty little flow sheets. We get data from those systems. We might also get them from uh, unstructured kind of data sometimes from Instagram, Pinterest, Twitter, those kinds of things, Snapchat. Um, we may also get them in structured form from those to a point, but most of that could be unstructured data. 
and the internet of things for instance all of those alexis alexis <laughs> alexa or series that we have in our homes uh our smart toasters our smart everything that we have in our homes smart refrigerators are all just collecting data on their environment and on us all the time that we're putting into some kind of repository or some company that's collecting data on us is putting into some kind of repository and we hope that there's some kind of good protection on that uh, but more often than not it's probably never enough some kind of analytics is performed on that um, and then hopefully they're validating their findings and that's hopefully turning into some kind of knowledge either through research or a generalized understanding of the way the world works or the way humans work um, and we're turning that into applications ways that we can take that data and act upon it descriptive predictive or prescriptive um, and also on patterns of understanding of how people and uh, users see and interact with the world so some metrics um, for analytics ready data um, which is which is kind of hard uh, there's not a lot of just data that is analytics ready but sometimes you will come across some that um, that, that can be so let's go through some of these data source reliability so you know we can Think of some of the, the V's that we had uh, originally um, with, with big data, um, but let's go with the reliability of the data. Um, we can think about how appropriate is the data that we're getting? Um, how reliable is it? Does it come from the first source? Meaning, does it come from its origination point? Or did we collect this through some kind of third party? Was it coming through an aggregator? Um, or how just in general confident are we about the, um, the correctness of the data that we're getting? Do we feel comfortable and confident that this da data is, is good data? And that kind of moves into the second one, accuracy. Um, is this data the right data for what we're trying to do? Um, not only one is it accurate in terms of is it truthful, but is it the right data for what we're trying to do? Is this the data that will answer the question that we're truly after? Accessibility, can we get this data whenever we want it all the time without fail? Or is this data only available certain times? Um, is it only available to certain people or what other limitations or boundaries might we have uh, in securing this particular bit of data? Security and privacy should always be a concern or at least a thought that we're having while we're collecting data or uh, accessing data to make sure that there's some kind of privacy around it. Most of us are at least somewhat familiar with the healthcare world and maybe we've heard uh, the acronym HIPAA, which is the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act which is really just there to kind of try to, um, people always think that it's always just there to protect, um, protect the end users, but it's also there to make sure that uh, people are not accessing your record when they shouldn't be. If someone is not involved in your care, uh, at some level they really should not be taking a look at your data. Uh, it also has some safeguards in it so that companies are following reasonable standards to make sure that those who guard your uh, your protected health information are doing uh, at least some levels of minimums and they're pretty low uh, to protect that data for you. <clears throat> data richness, what data elements are part of this set of data? Um, is it just one or two elements that are part of this? or there are multiple facets to this data. Um, the richer the data, the more, the, the, the more robust story we can tell with it. And consistency. So if we go down to what does consistency mean, does the data contain all of the fields all of the time? If we look at a data set, are there a lot of nulls in that, can, that data set? Or is it pretty consistently populated throughout the entire set? Um, do we have to constantly throw away uh, particular rows or columns or um, has it just really been uh, collected well and, and we can do a lot of work without having to do a lot of 
manipulation with it. Currency or timeliness, this does not necessarily relate to um, a, a financial transaction. This just relates to um, is the data relevant? So if we're looking, if we're trying to figure out transactions today, but um, we don't have a data dump from our OLTP database into our OLAP database, but weekly or monthly, it's going to be really difficult to find out what happened in our business yesterday. So timeliness is always important. And granularity, how deep does this data go? Do we capture, let's talk about transactions. Do we just capture the total cart value for your shopping excursion to Target? Or do we capture all of the things that were also in it? So we want to know how deep into the data or um, in, how deep into the transactions we go. And that can be referred to as, as granularity. And the last one here with uh, data validity and relevancy. Um, everything is relevant to what we're doing. Again, this data is uh, accurate to the question that we're trying to answer. For instance, um, this, you know, we're not trying to figure out uh, transaction history by looking at human resources tables. You know, we're making sure that everything uh, lines up with, the, again, those questions that we're trying to answer. So again, let's go back to some of the, the makeup and some of the vocabulary that is here. So data is the word we typically look at, and those are just the facts. And if you want to get really pedantic, you can call them datum or datum if you're looking at one specific piece of data. Um, I've never really in all my travels heard of anybody call them datum or datum, but you certainly can if that's what makes you happy. Structured data. Um, this is typically targeted for computers or processes, and this is um, more of um, the book will tell you this is a little more numeric versus a nomial. Um, this also just tends to be structured data tends to be a little bit more of things that folks have filled out in, let's say, surveys where they had to do pick lists or drop downs. Uh, versus allowing someone to do free type in a specific field so that there's not 15 different ways to spell data, uppercase, lowercase, um, or accidentally putting a, a space in between the letters or something like that. Um, just a little bit more um, planned in the way that somebody could enter in particular values. Unstructured textual data. So this might be something that uh, a human or at this point, machine learning may be better at handling where we're looking at pictures, for instance, or we're looking at um, the entire sentence or something where somebody has to ingest meaning or understand meaning or, or uh, context by looking at an entire uh, and the larger picture of what's going on there versus individual pieces of a sentence or uh, text or, or one individual pieces, uh, piece of uh, um, a form or, or something like that. Semi-structured data. So in here, there's XML, HTML, or a log file where it's outputted typically from a computer. And we always know where something lives. Um, a particular piece of data might live on the exact same section of a page every single time. And even while that may carry text that somebody had to um, type in manually, it always lives in the same section of a page and we can have a computer go look at that uh, specifically. So I just have this um, from the book, this, this photo from the book, and this comes out of page 61 to give you uh, some, more, some more vocabulary around this. On the left side with structured data, if we talk about categories, we have uh, nominal and ordinal. So when we have a nominal data set or data that's considered nominal, you can typically categorize this. So if we think of somebody has a, having, the, uh, for instance, a male status, you might be single, you might be divorced, you might still be married, you may be separated. Um, typically, it's something where there is some kind of a category you can put somebody in or a piece of data in. The other one will be ordinal. And this might be 
small, medium, large. We go to our Starbucks, we might have a grande, we might have a venti, you might have a treta uh, to get you started in the morning. Those are ordinal, where we can put them in some kind of some kind of ordinal, small, medium, large, for instance. On the right side, we have unstructured or semi-structured, where we have, again, the textual, uh, some multimedia, the Twitter images, Instagram images, and XML, or the last thing there, JSON, is pronounced JSON, which is um, another popular uh, programming language or a language that's used to um, get and ret well, uh, retrieve and send data across uh, websites, for instance, um, or to consume into a database. Okay. So just talking about it, I alluded to a little bit earlier when I was saying garbage in, garbage out. Um, the real world data is, of course, dirty, um, extremely complex and uh, very inaccurate because we're most often relying on people to do a lot of data entry. Um, and we really have to take our times, our, our time when we're, when we're working with these data sets to make sure that we're breaking them down into their simplest form. Sometimes you have to parse out data, which might mean take a long string of data and break it down into individual fields. Um, and that, that takes time and it certainly takes some um, some ability inside of, for instance, maybe SQL or Oracle to be able to parse that data out or, um, you know, from an XML feed or something like that. And it's certainly not ready for analytics. For analytics, we need to break it all the way down before we can put it all back together. So how do we do that? It's um, called data pre-processing. So we get a big lump of data in, we tear it apart, and then we will... Um, get it ready. So we might consolidate it. We might pull all like items together, clean it up, meaning we might fix spelling on things. We might uh, fix, uh, fix the way words are broken apart. We might transform data, meaning we might do a little, little bit of math or we might just clean up the way something is um, aligned. And then we also may do reduction, which is remove duplicates. So we might want to see unique patients or unduplicated patients. And that might mean that we want to re, uh, do some reduction. And it is certainly an art. There's a little bit of science in it and a little bit of art. And as you do this a little bit longer, you just get better and better at it. So some data reduction, um, you might have a dimensional reduction um, or variable selection. So when you talk about dimensional reduction. You might be removing some tables. Maybe there's too many tables in there. Um, you might, if you just have, uh, say you have um, a, a table that has sales information in it, but it's also capturing time of day and it's also capturing what the weather was like at that time. And it has all these variables in it that you just don't think are important. <clears throat> You may do a variable reduction where you create another table that's pulling out just the things you really care about. You know, I might care about the salesperson. I might care about, care about the individual things that were sold. And I might care about the customer. And the rest of those things I'm going to leave in the original tables. That could be a dimensional reduction based on variable selection. And that's pretty, pretty easy to do. And you might do a case or a sampling. So you might just take out a few rows from a specific table um, into something else for cleaning, um, just so that you can get a sense of what the data looks like, um, so that you can sort through it and maybe use that to kind of put a game plan together of how, um, you know, how you're going to tackle a larger, um, a, a larger data cleanup. So there's a, a couple of um, a, a couple of different items here, and this is uh, again from the book. This is page 68. 
some pre -pop, um, some pre-processing tasks that you might come across. Um, and I, I don't necessarily need to go through all of these, but certainly the data consolidation, you may you might use um, the SQL queries to to do some of those. When you're doing some data cleanings, you might handle in missing values. You know that everybody has a certain value or there's from a certain zip code, but for some reason it's not in the data and you might have to put it in there. Uh, you might do some normalization on that last one there and take out some outliers that have, um, that are statistical outliers. Um, we'll talk about some regression in a, in a bit. Um, you know there's just some dirty, erroneous data in there and you just have to remove those transactions from that or, or something along those lines. Just a, a few examples of some of those pre-processing tasks that you might find yourself uh, having to deal with. So we talked some of, about some of these analytics briefly in the last chapter, predictive, where we're talking about what has happened in the past, predictive, where we're again using that past data and those behaviors to try to figure out what some of our customers, for instance, might actually do in a given situation. And then we have prescriptive, which is where we might say, this is what we suggest the business might actually want to do in the future. Do not know why my slides keep going back and forth like that. So let's talk about some statistical modeling and how we can take a look at uh, applying those to, to uh, the analytics. So what are stats? Hopefully you've had some of these in the past and you're through that part and we may never really have to look back too much, but um, <clears throat> so statistics uh, is just a collection of mathematical techniques to characterize and interpret data. So the descriptive ones describe data as it is right now. Inferential statistics are drawing some inferences about the population based on the sample data. So we might take a look at some sample data and just make some inferences or make some assumptions about what's going on with the population of data, the population of people, the population of data, our customers, what have you, based on the sample that we're looking at. So I've got some formulas up here. Please don't worry about <laughs> memorizing formulas. That's not what this course is about. Um, we will handle most of that um, through applications when we get to that port, point in the course. So uh, the first one here, arithmetic mean, this is just the mean. And the mean is basically the average. Um, statisticians and researchers will prefer to use the word mean versus the word average. But essentially, for the, co for the purpose of what we're doing, we're talking about the average. And in the business world, you're going to want to use the word average versus the word mean. If you were to say, you know, this is the, the, the habits of our mean customer, someone is probably not going to have any idea what you're talking about. But if you say these are the buying habits of our average customer, you're gonna get attention. The next one down is the median. This is the number in the middle of a set. So if you have 10 numbers, one through 10, five is gonna be the middle number. That's the median. The last one is mode. This is the one with the most frequent observation. If I have a number set from one to five and I have one, two, two, three, four, five, then the mode is number two because it appeared twice in that list of numbers. One, two, two, three, four, five. The mode is two. Dispersion. Dispersion is the degree of variation in a given variable. So if I say temperature on a given day in the summer, dispersion is going to be that range to a point where how much the and don't be confused with the next one down, which is range giving me a min and max. Um, the variation here says that the temperature was, ten, uh, I don't know, 80 degrees. 
Um, and the degree of variation could have been five degrees, plus or minus five degrees could have been the variation, uh, the dispersion. The range for the day was 80 degrees, but our range was actually 75 to 85. And our variance, that nice pretty formula there, um, is typically displayed as a standard deviation, which is the square root of the variation. Uh, and that's how many full variances from the mean we got. And the mean absolute deviation, or MAD, is the average absolute deviation from the mean. These are going to pop up for you. Um, most of the time, you are never going to present the standard deviation, um, and you'll almost never use the word dispersion um, in any kind of a business setting. But for us pulling together data to present in a range or in a variance, um, those are things uh, in a dashboard, for instance, that we're going to want to know so that we can display them properly and most certainly be able to explain them to somebody. So getting into some of the ways that we can display some of these descriptive statistics, um, people will often use the term quartiles um, in, in what they're doing. And this is the number of points in a data set when you sort them all out and you break them down into quarters. Um, you lay them all out in a, in a uh, numerically and you break them into quarters, um, every 25% becomes a quartile. It's really easy to see this if you do it in a box plot, which is what's to the right here. Sometimes you'll see it called a box and whiskers plot, um, but it's a box plot. And if somebody really understands quartiles, um, then you can display a box plot to them. Um, sometimes this is a little bit more difficult to understand for some folks. The important thing with the box plot is explaining the quartiles. Some of the easier things here are you have the mean and the median, and people might get really easily confused by the mean and the median. I would not display both of these. I would just show um, perhaps where the mean is, which again is a simple average. Um, the median might come out to be something very different, and they're going to ask why you have two different sets of numbers in here, and, and that's going to be hard to explain. But you'll see when you have outliers to the data set, you can pull the mean up or down from where the actual median of the data is, and that can kind of skew the way you look at something. Um, especially if you have zeros in a range of scores, you can pull the mean down but the median might stay the same. So you have to be careful with the, these. If you're looking at quartiles, um, I have the upper quartile here where 25% of the data is larger than this value. Um, so if you're in the upper quartile, uh, 25, you're doing better than 75% of the people. If you're in the lower quartile, well then 75% of the folks in that, that data set are doing better or scored higher or did whatever um, better than the rest of the folks in that data set. So just make sure that you can explain quartiles pretty well if you go into, um, into using those. It's not my favorite to use quartiles. Um, certain industries will, will like quartiles a little better than others. Um, healthcare tends to use quartiles from time to time um, to, explain, to explain certain things. So um, I've certainly used quartiles in my life because um, I have a fair amount of history in healthcare. The next one on here uh, is a histogram. And textbooks love to use the word histogram, but no one in any business setting ever uses the word histogram. This is a bar chart. So feel free to use the word histogram, that's fine. But the rest of the world calls this a bar chart, and you know exactly what that is when I say it. It's just a bar chart. It's no need to call it a histogram if you don't want to. Do what makes you happy. In a bar chart, um, and especially if you put a, a line around the bar chart to kind of um, show you patterns or trends, um, you come up with the concept of skewness or the measure of symmetry. And I'm going to go to a chart in just a moment to talk about 
skewness and kurtosis. So skewness, the measure of asymmetry, would mean when we're looking at a bar chart um, and with a trend line over it, um, how, how symmetrical is the bar chart in the middle of, um, in the, middle of the distribution? The next one, uh, kurtosis, is how tall, skinny, short, fat the distribution is. So if we go to the next slide, we have a couple things here. So this top one displays kurtosis a bit. If we look at the red, we'll see this is taller and skinnier. Um, and this is just the way that we're gonna describe this as kurtosis. And this shorter one is a little, um, shorter, more broad, um, maybe a different kind of normal distribution depending on what's going on. Um, so an, a positive kurtosis will say that this is a tall or um, a peaked distribution and a negative kurtosis will give us a, a flat or a shorter uh, peak, or normal, I'm sorry, a flatter or shorter distribution. And then that also gets down into having skewedness. So if something is positively skewed, you'll see it living to the left side of our, our bar graph here with the tail on the right side, it's positive. If something is negatively skewed, you'll see it living on the right side with most of its tail living over here on the left side. So just be careful when you see any kind of skewedness sitting in here. So I have two slides here, and these come out of the book on page 82 um, and 83, and technically over into 84. And this will be your assignment. This is something I want you to recreate in Excel. And you can do this in Mac, and you can do this on a PC. And it's super simple to do. I just want you to create this and then upload the Excel form into Blackboard and I'll have a Dropbox here available in week for you to take a look at. Um, you can go in on a PC, go into options, add in this analysis tool, back, tool pack and it'll be over here. And then I just want you to go in and create the expense and demand, go all the way down and just create um, this summary and just do it as it says here on a new worksheet. And then go in with those exact same numbers and go to the histogram or the bar chart and add in a box and whisker chart. Um, you don't have to necessarily add too much character to it, but you certainly can and change the colors if, if that's what makes you happy. Um, you're certainly welcome to do that. If you're a Mac user, it's a little bit different. So you won't be able to see it on my screen, but once you open Excel for Mac, you'll go to the tools and you'll go to Excel add-ins. It's a little bit different. In Windows, I think you just go to File and Options. In Mac, you have to go to Tools and Add-ins. And then you'll add in the Analysis Tool Pack, and it will appear on the Data tab. And then you'll have Data Analysis. And then you're able to go in and add in the things that you want, which is the descriptive, um, the descriptive statistics and you'll be able to carry through the example um, just as a PC user would. So it's the exact same once you get past it. Again, you just go to Tools, Excel add-ins, and add in, add in the, Excel, uh, the Analytics uh, tool pack. If you're using a Mac PC, it's under the File menu. So I just want you to just create both of those and upload the Excel file to me for 25 points. I will have that posted for you. So we'll move on and start talking about regression. So regression modeling is a big scary word um, or um, a big scary phrase, I should say, that we'll talk about what we're trying to do using inferential statistics to try to figure out why something is the way it is, or what relationship two variables, uh, one variable may have on um, a, a specific uh, item that we're trying to test. Um, there's also the possibility that it can have uh, two variables uh, on, uh, we're going to take a look at two variables on a specific item. 
So let's talk about the first one. And this is um, just a regular regression, part of inferential statistics. It's one that's the most widely known and used in most of statistics. It's also pretty much the easiest. And this will be used to characterize the relationship between some input and a response. And this is mostly used for hypothesis testing. We're trying to figure out, you know, here's what I think is happening here. Let's go check one at a time. We're doing some kind of forecasting, um, some type of prediction. So the first thing we need to think about is what is the difference between correlation and regression? Because they're not necessarily the same. Correlation assumes that the item that we're the two items that we might be testing together have no um, they, they have no dependence on each other. They don't necessarily have to, there's no relationship between the two items. Whereas a regression is the opposite. We assume there's some kind of a relationship there um, and we're trying to figure out what it is. So correlation, we're trying to figure, we don't think there is a relationship there. We might be trying to find out if there is one. Regression, assume there is one and we're trying to figure out how tightly knit together they are, how tight the relationship they are. A simple regression versus a multiple regression. A simple regression is testing two things. So we might be looking at height versus weight, and we might be looking at how tall you get versus what your weight might be. A multiple regression may still be looking at your your height, how tall you're getting, and your weight, but may also take some other things into consideration like your ethnicity. And we're taking a look at what happens um, when we examine your, your, your weight and your age or your weight and your ethnicity against your height and try to see what the relationship between those variables are on your height or your weight, for, for instance, whatever it is that we're trying to test. How do we put these uh, models together? One of the easiest ways is a scatter plot. And this is another visualization that's super simple to do in Excel. Um, we can also use the ordinary least squares method. Um, and I'll talk about that when I show this next slide. This is a scatter plot where each one of these little circles is just mapping out a particular data point that we've collected. And we can say here, that on the y-axis and the x-axis, on the x-axis, we have an explanatory variable. Maybe this is your height. And then on the y-axis, we have your response variable, which is your weight. And in this instance, as we move away from, um, away from zero here, that as your height goes up, your weight goes up. And then we have um, all these data points that go all over the place. And then in the middle, you'll see we have a solid kind of maroon line that's our regression line. If we use the least uh, ordinary least squares method, what we're doing is we're trying to figure out which of these individual data points, um, when you square it, has the smallest distance back to a common line. As we draw this line through the middle, whichever the sum of each of the data points has the smallest line when you square it, that tends to be the regression line and it's linear. So Excel will do this easily for you and come up with your regression line. And you may see that in this instance, there is a positive, reg there's a positive regression here. Uh, as your height goes up, your weight goes up. As your height goes down, your weight goes down. And hopefully that's what we want to see. Hopefully you don't see that your height goes down. Uh, and your weight goes up. A couple things we have here, we have the X input. Again, the X input was your height. The Y output was your height. Um, this is the simple, um, the simple linear regression formula um, where we just have beta zero 
uh, plus uh, beta sub 1x. And we're not going to go through these, and you certainly don't have to recognize them, uh, or I'm sorry, memorize them. This is not something that is necessary to do. We have applications that will do this for us, and this is not that kind of a class. But here's the formula if you uh, want to make a t-shirt out of them. How do we know if our regression is good enough? Well, there's a couple different things here. We can check them out using um, uh, root squared. Um, you can take a look at their p-values. Anything with a p-value of minus, I think, 0 0.05 tells you that there is uh, a significant value there. And there's error measures for the prediction um, that you might come up with here. So um, the MAD, which we saw a couple slides ago, I'll go back to that for you. The mean absolute deviation. So we're checking the absolute deviations from the mean to let you know that something could be out of whack. Um, root square, excuse me, root mean square error, RMSE, is another way that we can tell what kind of error we may be seeing. And we'll also have the mean squared error, the MSE test. Um, these are not something that we're going to have to get into right now that can tell us some of the errors that we could possibly have. <clears throat> so some of the assumptions that we're going to make if we're using these types of uh, these particular types of models. One, we're going to assume that the regression is linear. The relationship is linear. As your height goes up, your weight goes up. This independence, um, they don't necessarily have to um, impact one another. There's a normal distribution. Variance is constant. You could do multicollinearity. And I know multicollinearity is kind of fun, even the concept of it. Um, but that tells us that each of the variables isn't necessarily correlated. So we don't necessarily know that they have a relationship with each other. Um, but they might. And um, what do we do if the assumptions don't hold? What do we do? Well, in that case, we break out the next tool. And we go to logistic regression models, and things get a little bit more complicated. In these ones here, um, this is uh, a different set of rules. We're no longer going to, of course, the, it's not a linear thing anymore. Um, it's not um, a linear regression anymore, and everything becomes a little bit a little bit more difficult. But again, we have the tools that can help us, and Excel is certainly one of those. Um, this is a little more statistics-based and um, not so easy to do just in Excel, I should say. Uh, developed in the 40s, and um, there's a difference, obviously, between the linear regression and our logistics one. And... Um, We'll talk about this being a binomial, um, and I'll explain this just a little bit more, where everything uh, also has a coefficient as we go through everything. So you can see this is not necessarily, um, it, it definitely ha has a different look to it. It's not just as easy to um, always to work with. So what's the difference? What's the main difference here? So we can take a look at this and we can compare it back to our linear regression and say, well, okay, we have a line that goes right through this and this is great. And you can, this is a quarterly sales one here. This is just an example in sales, but we can also do the same thing with weather patterns, for instance. And is this actually different? Well, it is. Um, in this instance, there is a couple different variables. There is maybe a seasonality um, where certain things only happen in certain seasons. Um, there's other influences that we don't know or can't see or can't predict. Um, there's a couple, there's just not an easy way and to, pre to necessarily predict what's going to happen based on past actions or um, the ability to well, I guess past actions is a, is a good way to say it, um, or based on how something always kind of functions. You know, if I look at the linearity of height versus weight, typically that's always the way it goes. And 
in nonlinear regress regressions or logistics that logistic regressions that's just not how it always works there is an exponential forecast there's an exponential possibility in there when we go back um, once we start dealing with the exponential issue where things will uh, could potentially pick up faster uh, and change at different rates um, and we may not be able to always forecast exactly what will happen with sales or, or something like that so definitely different <clears throat> and we'll get into um, some of those a little bit later it's just right now introducing the concepts introducing the vocabulary and the terminology so business reporting definitions some concepts just switching gears a little bit here on on this one and kind of getting getting ourselves away from um, some forecasting um, a report this is all about getting some information to somebody so that they can make a decision or take some kind of action what exactly is a report this is any form of communication it can be excel with a pile of numbers in it pdfs dashboards any kind of communication it can really just be a verbal report it could be an email paragraph that talks about um, the state of being of something it can fulfill a couple of functions um, proper departmental functioning tell you how sales are going, staff productivity, anything like that. Giving information, uh, some background, provide the results of an analysis. I just took a look at, you know, how our sales were this quarter versus last quarter, uh, persuading others to act. Um, you know, this could be telling folks, here's, here's where we are in payroll. We might need to lay some folks off, for instance, um, and persuading someone that that's the appropriate access or um, that's the appropriate action to take and to create an organizational memory so we just want to solidify in everyone's memory that this is what sales look like at this quarter of the year um, and this upswing or downswing whatever it may be is pretty typical for us so what's the business report um, typically a written document that contains whatever business matters whatever the purpose may be for managerial decisions um, the source the data could come from inside could come from outside the organization. If it comes from outside, we're gonna use an ETL, extract, transform, and load. We're gonna extract it from everyone's data source, do whatever transaction or transformation we need to do and load it into our system. Um, our format could be text, tables, charts, graphs, whatever we need to go. Um, and the distribution could be imprint, it could be a portal and those, you know, uh, email, I should say, or we can portal, throw it on the internet. Um, uh, however, we, however, the normal decision is um, that we would normally send that information out to folks, whatever is normal for your company. And the last thing, the data, the data acquisition, information generation, decision making, process manage management is just the flow of this report. We're gonna get the data, generate some kind of information about it, pass it along to some decision maker, and then they're going to influence, manage, or create some process around it that the organization is gonna follow. Kind of the same thing that we have here um, in this graph, um, just as a photo drawing. Some types of the reports that you might see, hear about, or experience if you have not already. Um, metric management, um, a metric management report. So we might see a couple of things here. An SLA, a service level agreement for externals, KPI, key performance indicators for internals. And these are metrics that your company may have to hit. If you're doing consulting kind of work, you may have for external clients, a service level agreement where you will turn around tickets or whatever um, from your help desk within a certain amount of time. And that could be a service level agreement. KPIs, key performance indicators, those may mean that your sales reps are hitting certain targets every month or every quarter. Could be used as part of Six Sigma or total quality management. You know, your, your KPI could mean so many rejects per thousand could be part of your um, TQM. And dashboard type reports, graphical presentations, um, several performance indicators, 
and people just love gauges and dials. And balance scorecard type reports, um, you know, you these are a little bit less graphic dial heavy and probably a little bit more just showing out uh, raw numbers and maybe still some graphs, um, but less with the dials and the gauges that are becoming more and more popular. And we get into the concept of data visualization, which has been around for a long time, but tends to really be taking off um, as of late and is really kind of moving now into its own um, its own field, really. This is the use, uh, the use of uh, visual representations to help communicate and make sense of what can be really, really complicated um, graphics or, or metrics and help people understand what's happening in a quick snapshot kind of way. A data visualization versus an information vis visualization. So the concept of a data visualization might be taking um, sales data, um, those KPIs again, and giving dials and graphs around that so people can quickly compare, I don't know, quarters or sales numbers, things along those lines to last quarter, last year, something along that versus an information visualization, which could be an infographic kind of thing. Um, so definitely a bit, a bit differently. Um, they're not so different that you can't interchange them, but um, th they can sometimes point to two different things. Information talks about the aggregation, summarization, and giving the that data some context. Otherwise, it's just bits of raw data if you don't give some context to them. Why is this important um, and what does it apply to? You're going to want to put context around everything. Related infographs, any scientific visualizations, and stats graphs are helpful as well. Always be careful with your percents. When you throw out a percent, 50 percent of respondents surveyed said yes, well, that doesn't help us. When you say 50 percent of respondents, um, you could have emailed two people and one of two people is 50%. And that doesn't really carry much weight. Or you could say 50% of respondents and you sent out a thousand surveys and 500 people responded. That's, that's, much more, um, that's much more impactful. So always be careful when you're sending out stats and whatnot because you really can mislead people um, with your stats. And they often are full of charts, graphs, and and any kind of illustrations you can get your hand on. Um, you, you can take data visualization uh, all the way back to 1600s, really. Um, and there's some, uh, there, I think there were a lot of graphs that started to come out around the early 1800s that people were starting to, starting to latch on to, but it really wasn't recognized as a discipline. Um, and it started to only um, go back the last couple hundred years and even more so today is when it's really uh, starting to take off on its own. William Playfair, <clears throat> credit as the inventor of the modern chart. You know, so if you're somewhere and you need to have a good trivia question, I suppose this could probably be a good one that no one is ever going to get. Um, first query, the first line, and pie charts is this William Playfair. And this one here is <laughs> apparently, according to the book, the decimation of Napoleon's army in the 1812 Russian campaign is is arguably, and I'm not sure who's arguing that, I've never argued this in my life, the most popular multi-dimensional chart. There's actually quite a lot of data that lives um, in this chart, and it's kind of interesting if you uh, take a look at the different pieces, not only up here, but down here as well, um, on a topographical kind of graph uh, bar chart. Um, what data do you want to show in your chart? And this kind of gives you some information about what might be the appropriate chart for how much data you're trying to show. A couple different variables, um, pie charts, uh, heat maps, those kinds of things. What might be the appropriate chart based on how many things that you might like to show and what, what keeps things simple enough for somebody to read. Um, these ones here, which also kind of are heat maps, um, are, are powerful charts as well. 
um, different colors, sizes based on their intensity or how many people are involved in that specific data set are always uh, pretty popular ones. Um, <laughs> data visualization and the companies that are really involved in it. Um, you'll have Microsoft involved in there with Power BI, SAS, SAP, IBM with Cognos, of course, uh, Tableau is also uh, coming online as somebody that people are, are looking at with a powerful data analytics solution as well. So um, those are a couple to take a look at. Microsoft Power BI, SAP, SAS, IBM's Cognos, and Tableau um, are the ones that I've had some experience taking a look at. Uh, again, I just mentioned Tableau. I've not worked with Spotfire or ClickView. Um, but these are some other ones uh, down here to take a look at. Cognos has been around for a long time and is widely respected um, in the area of analytics and, and visualization. And of course, Power BI is becoming a large player as well. So visual analytics, um, information visualization, and doing some predictive analytics is kind of a bit of a new term where we can take the data and instead of predicting it out with just uh, numerical models, um, using a graphics application to kind of push it forward. And I know Tableau does a nice job with that one specifically. Um, information visualization, descriptive, it's backward focused. Um, it's more of a what happened and now what is happening. It's not really doing it forward. That's where the predictive analytics comes in. Um, and that is what will happen and maybe a little bit of information about why it will, why specifically this will happen. And we're moving more towards this visual kind of analytics uh, and away specifically from um, giving people large um, charts of numbers or pro formas on what will happen in the future and trying to move it more into visualization for, for quick, um, quick thinking. Um, people tend to be wanting to go in that direction. So performance dashboards, kind of the same idea. Performance dashboards are used in business process management, software suites, BI platforms, and it's the quick, very visual display of that important information so that people don't have to take a long time to analyze a spreadsheet. They can quickly get that snapshot uh, by taking a look at this. And it is just another, I don't know, um, Another sign of the times, I suppose, where people don't necessarily want to take their time looking at um, looking at a chart, um, an Excel chart, and just want to basically see this. Um, very quickly, you can get the same information, and I totally get it. I can see where our sales are, our margin. I can see last year's margin. So all of a sudden, why is there this huge gap in margin? I can see where we're getting the most bang for our buck. I can see where our expenses are much more quickly than I can if I had to sift through an Excel chart. This is much more easily digestible for anyone, not just an executive, for your sales reps. Um, this, is, this is much more appealing and much more easy, again, to digest. So it's clear, in my opinion, why why we tend to be moving more towards these visual representations rather than giving people just rows and rows and rows of, of data and having them try to figure it out uh, on their own. So talking about the dashboard design, you know, it, the fundamental challenge of all of these is display as much information as you possibly can jam in here without jamming so much that the meaning is lost. And it needs to be a, a quick look clear, no distractions, so that people can get the data quick and move on. Um, and then, you know, let's see, what to look for, um, <clears throat> visual components, highlight the data, and maybe be able to call out things that um, are becoming a problem or want to be, um, you know, want to be on someone's radar. Typically people use three different colors. Again, it's just like a stoplight green, yellow, red are the ones that people tend to use the most. Um, you shouldn't have to do a lot of explaining on your dashboards, your graphs, your gauges. It should be pretty clear what's going on with just a few words. If it's not, you made it too complicated. You should be able to combine data from a couple different systems into just one, and you may need to use an ETL process, again, an extract, transform, and load process, maybe to pull data from disparate databases into one system, but 
That's kind of what you have to do sometimes to build these dashboards. Um, sometimes if you just dump it all into Excel and build the dashboard, well, then you might be able to do it, but that's a lot of manual work and that's not always the goal of these. You wanna be able to present a dynamic real world view with the data. So hopefully you're doing this out of an OLAP database that has been refreshed pretty recently, hopefully overnight so that you have data that is, um, that is fresh for everyone. And they usually require just a little bit of coding to implement. Um, if you're doing Tableau, once you have it set up, it's pretty good to go. You don't have to keep touching it. Cognos, the same thing. And of course, Power BI, once you spend a little time on the back end, um, they're pretty easy to refresh and deploy um, all the time. When you're coming up with your KPIs, uh, make sure that you're using KPIs that are the, the ones your company all uses, but also that they're in line with the industry standards. You don't want to um, not use the same ones that are appropriate across the industry. Wrap the metrics with contextual metadata to make sure that you don't just have numbers floating out there that folks don't know um, what those numbers mean or why they're important. Um, validate this by a usability specialist if you have one. If not, you can always take it to just somebody that might use this dashboard and say, if I just gave you this, do you understand what these numbers mean and tell me truthfully. Um, Make sure that the end user also has a chance to take a look at these and understand. Prioritize and rank alerts and exceptions. Um, you know, if things are slipping into the red anywhere, make sure that you're able to create actionable alerts with that. Um, <clears throat> enrich dashboards with business user comments. So, you know, if, uh, if you're able to pull in customer comments from maybe a CRM, a customer resource management system, or you have end user comments and you can bring that in so that people see sales, but maybe they're also seeing what, what people are saying about the company, bring that in. Um, and again, it, around picking the right visuals for the right time, provide guided analytics. You should be able to, in a few words, explain what's going on um, and not have to um, overly explain everything. <clears throat> 